Hello. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? It's going really well. And how's it going there? It's a Monday. It's a mo you know you know it will always be a Monday on Astronomy Cast. I know. I know. Yay! My it's Monday. Monday. It's Pleasure. Astronomy Cast. This is the good part of my Monday. The rest of my Monday is oh my God, what happened to my inbox? Just just set the whole <laughs> thing on fire. That's what I recommend. Don't tempt me. Yeah. I like my computer though. If I could like uniquely set the the inbox database on fire, then maybe. You can. It's easy to do. Just press delete. Just one button. Delete. That's not the same thing as killing it with fire. <laughs> killing it with fire. That's true. Um, so I had a bird outside my door this morning, just really loud, and I'd never heard it before. It's like, what uh -huh. is that bird? It turns out it was a squirrel. Just a really loud, really aggressive squirrel was yelling at my cat. So I was down <laughs> at the bottom of the tree, and the squirrel was at the top of the tree, a fairly small tree, just screeching at it. That was pretty funny. But we've got these two little kinds of squirrels. We've got these we've got these native little brown jobbies, and then we've got yeah. the sort of bigger, the big, um, yeah, there's Red a much bigger, bushier, the, the invasive species one. And it was nice to see one of our native guys here. So, cool. yeah. Um, cool. So if anyone has no idea what it is that they've stumbled into, uh, this is uh, going to be a live episode of Astronomy Cast. We're going to take about 30 minutes record uh, an episode, episode two, 348, That's, you know, what's 100 episodes here and there, uh, 348, which is on 2 Independence Square, which is the NASA headquarters, where all of the Mar the, the moon missions and the uh, all of the, you know, the Gemini program and all that was, was conceived and planned and, and administrated. And still, Space Shuttle, all the big programs are all still done from this place. So it's a cool building. Have you been there? No, I haven't. No, okay. Um, and this is just to continue on the numbering uh, theme. Have we got a number for next week as well? So so the building was built in 1992, so I, I really don't think but NASA much headquarters. of what you said was true. Oh, NASA headquarters, though, in Washington. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> is it a whole new location? Yes. Oh, okay, all right. Well, then I should just edit my intro then. <laughs> um, NASA headquarters is kind of a new, con newly conceived idea. Okay, I'm alright. I'm still okay with my uh, with what I've got. Um, okay, so we'll take about half an hour. We'll record the episode, and then we'll stick around, and uh, Pamela will answer your most difficult questions about space and astronomy. Thanks, okay. Pamela. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> uh, so two other pieces of note. Uh, one, we're both going to be at Dragon Con this year. Hey. So that's going to be Labor Day weekend. We'll do obviously a live episode of Astronomy Cast and then whatever else they they want us to do. We live only to serve. Uh, and then um, we're going to be going on hiatus. So starting at the not end, before Dragon Con, not after. Before, yeah, yeah, before Dragon Con. So so we'll do uh, probably three more episodes. We'll wrap up June. Yeah. And then we'll take July and August off. And uh, we'll be back. The first return will be the Dragon Con episode, and then we'll get back into the regular swing of things. So. And and those of you who are in the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, uh, Nicole Gallucci and I are both going to be at the ASP meeting. And then for those of you who are in Europe, um, I and perhaps more of my team will be going to the European Planetary Sciences Conference in September. And for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, it looks like I'm going to be doing another speaking tour of New Zealand and Australia in October. So prepare to travel with us. With you? Yeah, so you got a bunch of traveling coming up. Okay, um, well let's get rolling. Tell me when you're ready. I am pressing record, and it is recording in mono. I got it right. I have also pressed record. It is also recording. All right. Get my intro bit. Okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 348, 2 Independence Square, the NASA headquarters. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. 
Hey Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Fraser. How are you doing? I am doing great. Uh, so we want to give people a couple of quick, quick announcements. Number one, uh, we're going to be going on hiatus as we do in the summer because, you know, it's nothing to do. We just want to hang out, enjoy time in the sun. Um, so we're going to be off. So we're going to finish up our last episode at the end of June. And then we won't be recording through July and August. And then, uh, as usual, we'll come back with a bang in September. We'll be recording a live episode at DragonCon in Atlanta, which is over Labor Day weekend. And that is, I guess, the second piece of a news and announcement to make, which is that we will we'll be recording a live episode, both Pamela and I will be at, uh, we'll be at DragonCon in, in Labor Day weekend. So come say hi. We'd love to see you. We, we are hoping to have a booth yet again, and uh, we'll have lanyards and t-shirts and science, and we shall science you. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, and now, people will know what we look like. Before, they had to just detect us by voice. <laughs> <laughs> and no. that happened. That was always creepy when that happened in airports and stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly, in Starbucks waiting lines. Um, okay, well, let's get cracking. All right. So although NASA is spread across the entire U.S., the headquarters ba is based right in Washington, D.C., and the headquarters building is known as Two Independent Square. This is where past and future space policy for the agency was developed. All right, now, Pamela, you picked, you put this on our numbers episode, so we're three numbers in. I have no idea what we're going to be doing next week, but, uh, but you picked Two Independent Square, the number two. So what is this building? It is the place where all the big decisions are currently getting made, where they have representatives of all of the NASA centers, all of the major NASA programs, and everyone is crammed into a rental office building. <laughs> Number two independent square. Number two independent square. This, the, one of the reasons that I picked this topic is when you hear people talking about I'm going to NASA headquarters, I work at NASA HQ. In my head, at least, there's always been this big government building idea that it was another federal building that, that had the marble and the granite and the stuff and the things that just leads you to feel like this is something permanent. And then when I found out that it's just a rental property that's not even that big in terms of what all's housed there, it kind of made me sad. And when I learned that most of the movers and shakers who make NASA happen live in cube farms in this building that's not quite big enough, it made me even more sad. And I wanted to crush the dreams of our listenership so that they could realize that in order to make space happen, NASA has crammed into too small of an office space that they rent in Washington, D.C. See, so now what I was imagining was this crazy place where you've got like factories and people assembling rockets and testing out weird technologies and, you know, you could walk down the hall and some guy comes up with a clipboard and he's got some weird material to test. But you know what's the funny thing is that I've actually been to the SpaceX facility and that's what it is. So we and and go Goddard is like that. It's NASA you, headquarters isn't like that, like but that, Goddard, yeah. and to a lesser degree, Ames and and um, Marshall. Yeah, you go to SpaceX, right. and and you know there's Elon Musk's really cool office, and there's where all the there's the mission control center for SpaceX, and over there is where they're constructing the next round of Merlin rockets, and here's the titanium 3D printing apparatus, and over there you're not even allowed to go because it's like crazy secret stuff going on. So, um, but yeah, it's not that. It is it is a cube farm for NASA. Okay. I, I don't... Okay. Sorry, trying not to die laughing at the reality. It's either laugh or cry. Oh. Um, so, so NASA is, is 11 main facilities and then there are people kind of distributed all across the United States, like myself, that don't work for NASA, but are funded by NASA. And, and so the crazy thing is that even when you go to Goddard and stuff, the majority of the people who are working there are contractors. They aren't civil service, they aren't federal permanent employees, they're contractors through some third party working off of grants and government uh, agreements and NASA itself is, is very much an idea with funding. And 
and there are those lucky civil servants that organize and keep everything going and hire the contractors and decide who gets the funding. And then the thing that is the NASA that we think of, the building of the spacecrafts, well, that's often Lockheed or Boeing or Martin Marietta or one of these other aerospace firms. The, um, the designing the materials of the future, that is people working in university laboratories. The writing of the software and, and other things, that's often university employees. So NASA is a concept and NASA headquarters is kind of where they have developed the bureaucracy to keep everything going. Where do they cry about budget cuts? Is that done NASA in the headquarters? That is done That's in NASA part headquarters. of why I wanted to bring this up. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so then so then what I guess what are some people who we might be aware of who are at NASA headquarters? Well, I, I think the the two that you and I are most likely to to know the names of are Charlie Bo Bowden and John Grunsfeld. So that is the uh, well head honcho himself, Charlie Bowden. Basically, he is the current administrator of NASA, and he is the one that is working to try and keep things going, who is walking down the street to testify before Congress, to talk with Obama, to, to try and keep everything funded. And then beneath him we have all of the different mission directorate leaders and even though you and I think spacecraft all the time, what we're actually thinking is science mission directorate. Uh, NASA is divided into a bunch of, of different directorates and so there's the aeronautics which works to try and get um, new ways of traveling, so faster, safer, better aircraft, uh, working with the FAA on commercial space flight rules, all of those sorts of things. Then you have the Human Space Flight and Exploration Directorate. Those are the people that work with the International Space um, Station. Then you have Science Mission Directorate, and that's us. That's Hubble Space Telescope, that's Mars Curiosity, that's the Landsat missions that are studying the planet Earth, that's Solar Dynamic Orbiter with the Sun. So within Space Mission Directorate we have Planetary, Helio, Earth, and Astrophysics. And, and so everything gets subdivided and you have the various leaders of the various groups and they're all kind of crammed into that one building. And then that's separate from the different NASA centers, right? Like I know there's a, there's a, there's a director for Ames, there's a director for Marshall, there's a director for Kennedy Space Center, et cetera. And I guess they sort of go back and forth and do and spend time in, the, in Washington right. and then go back to their specific directorate. So, so there's 11 different NASA facilities, including headquarters, so that you have Johnson Space Flight Center, Kennedy, Ames, um, Dresden, which is one of the places where they do a lot of flight testing, so that's where the aeronautics part really comes in. You have the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in California, that is very much science. Uh, you have Stennis Space Center, which um, I'm having to read my notes on this one because it's one I always forget about. Uh, it's where they do the heavy lift and propulsion technology and they're also working on how do you integrate in commercial crews uh, so trying to figure out the um, government space versus commercial space inter interface. You have Marshall Space Flight Center which is also where the main space camp is located. Um, there's the Glenn Research Center in Ohio where they do a lot of, well that's where the people doing the new technologies are. I know they have an amazing laser lab there. You have Goddard outside of Washington DC which is another one of these multi-building working on developing spacecraft, building the instrumentation type of places. Then you have Langley which is another flight center. Um, the, the way they, they describe themselves is they're doing game-changing development and earth science missions and aeronautics research. Um, so basically Langley and Dresden are where a lot of the new things flying through the sky first get to take wing and then we just work our way up and across as, as we 
distribute these centers across America and distribute the tasks. And then in addition to the major centers, then there's like minor work that gets done in pretty much every single state in the entire United States, right? I know there's yes. there's there's launch facilities, there are uh, small research facilities, and then a lot of contractors that they work with as well. And every state in the union has a NASA Space Grant Consortium. These are uh, usually located at universities, and they're facilities that get a certain amount of money that they distribute to try and uh, benefit the state by springboarding off of various NASA technologies and educational developments. So you'll see a lot of small university projects, a lot of graduate programs getting seed money out of the NASA Space Grant Consortiums. Right, and so, and then as you know, the, as you said, so we've got the universities, and then I guess they've got their liaisons with the other space agencies in the world. They've got work with the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, I guess not the Chinese. <laughs> well, actually, we do work with the Chinese. We just don't. That that's one of the weird things is uh, due to a congressional rider, I think it was. We're not allowed to generally spend money going to China. But there are special exceptions. There's actually special seed money to develop programs between NASA and China. So if you belong to one of those programs, you're allowed to go, but the rest of the time you're not. Um, and, and this is the contradictions you sometimes get between congressmen throwing in riders to bills at the last moment versus what are actually in the best interests of the country. And collaborating with China is in the best interests of the country when it comes to developing space flight and figuring out the future. So it's a complicated dance and all of this dance is is organized out of 300,000 square feet on 12 floors, three of which are below ground by the way, um, at two independent square. So then what is the process I guess of you know for the kinds of budgetary stuff, the new missions, the new kinds of ideas that are being pushed forth, you know, a lot of that work starts and ends in Washington. So, so what is the process for people who maybe you know have have never experienced this kind of sausage making up close, <laughs> which so, I know you so, have? Yeah, sadly. So I'm going to go over the normal process and then go over the current process because uh, we're in special times, as I'm going to get to. So, so normally, what happens is the folks at NASA headquarters, in consultation with the community. Uh, come up with priorities for the next 10 years. And this is often drafted by the community in the form of a decadal survey and through headquarters in consultation with Congress and the President. And then money is put forward to meet those goals, often in a competitive nature where people say, okay, so we need to have this many missions that cost roughly this much and are testing new technologies, this many that are forming the basis of our ability to survey the sky. So you have the great observatories came out of this, Hubble, Chandra, Spitzer, Herschel. Um, then we also have the uh, small missions, the, the missions like Dawn that are exploratory missions. Um, all of these are competed. So, so the process is we need X. Go forth, propose how you're going to do X. And you have everyone from university faculty to center liaison, well not liaisons, but center-based engineers and scientists working in large collaborations put together budgeted, detailed, science-driven proposals on how we're going to accomplish these things. Now when you say we need X, is that like, for example, like we need more information about the corona of the sun or are they more specific, like we need to send a mission to Pluto? That, that can actually be highly variable. So for instance, we currently have a, I believe it's a presidential um, authorization or want is probably the best word to land human beings on an asteroid by 2025. So this is one of those things that NASA due to the president is working on. 
And so it starts out with, we are looking for proposals on how to develop the technologies that will be needed. So it starts with exploratory proposals. And then eventually it will be, we need a spacecraft capable of getting human beings to an asteroid. So it will go from general, we'll say yes to a bunch of people, to highly specific. And, and this is where you end up with things such as, we know we need a Mars sample return, so that was a specific call, but we also know that we need to explore the outer solar system. So there were a series of proposals that, that were put in. Uh, everything, Juno was one of these proposals, there was a mission proposed uh, to go out to Europa, another one proposed to go out to, I don't remember if it was New, uh, Neptune or Uranus. Um, but there'll be a series of missions that say we're going to take on these science goals at this price point and then they'll narrow the group of five or six of these down to if we're lucky the two and if we're unlucky the one that is funded. Right and so okay so you've got this they've put this competitive system together they've you know they've described the RFP the request for proposal request proposals. the the people have have responded to the proposal they've narrowed down their choices they've maybe selected the mission or missions that are going to be fulfilling these these objectives so what happens next then there are massive contracts then you spend however many years 5 10 20 that it takes to construct your mission hoping congress doesn't cancel you uh, once you're launched, things are good for the duration of your mission, except the length of time a spacecraft is likely to survive is generally far in excess of how long your initial funding survives. So at that point, you go into what's called senior review. Uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has done this, for instance. It's where you say, we have an operational spacecraft, we have these new science goals that we're capable of, we want to do these things, this is how much it's going to cost, and should you fail to fund us, here's how we're ending our mission. And this is where things get scary. So what we're looking at right now is it, it looks like Spitzer didn't make it through senior review. It looks like Spitzer's about to be canceled. Same thing for Sophia, although Sophia may have more of a fighting chance. Um, and so if you're lucky, when you fail senior review, you meet the fate that WISE met. You get put into a safe, high orbit and put into standby mode, and you hope that someday the funding will come from somewhere to turn your spacecraft back on. If you're unlucky, you deorbit your spacecraft, you send it to a museum if it's something you can get back to the surface of the planet safely. When has that ever or, happened? Fair enough. Um, Space shuttles is what I was thinking of. The yeah. space shuttles got museum based. I um, mean, the space shuttles brought a few things back with them now and then. They got to go into museums. Um, and when you're really unlucky, your nice, healthy mission out far away, like Cassini, which seems to be safe right now, but we're not entirely sure, um, gets crashed into the atmosphere of a distant planet, and there's no return from that. Right. Um, now, now you said that like you know you have to be careful that Congress doesn't cancel your mission, but but does it really work that way that Congress cancels missions on a case by case basis, or do they just say, sorry NASA, you've got no additional budget, or you've got less budget, um, figure it out? It it can go both ways. You can end up with what happened to the Fermi mission, for instance, back when it uh, still hadn't been launched and it was glassed. Um, the the gamma ray telescope that is now called Fermi was canceled uh, due to NASA budget cuts. They decided they weren't going to be able to complete it and launch it. There is a huge public outcry, in part driven by the fact that this was a mission that had put a lot of emphasis into trying to communicate to the public why we need gamma ray observatories, what this is useful for, setting up networks of people to to. Uh, be able to do all sorts of really awesome science and those people raised a human outcry and managed to get Congress to instate a specific line saying you're going to keep building this. At the same time there, there have been many times when the James Webb Space Telescope has almost been cancelled by NASA. No, not by NASA, almost cancelled by Congress because a congressman will 
get upset that NASA didn't know how to a priori completely budget a mission that is entirely new technology. And the fact that occasionally uh, you get things really, really wrong when you're developing entirely new technology to put it in an orbit beyond the moon, um, that doesn't surprise me, but it's not something NASA is allowed to have the slot for. And you end up with things going away. And what's really rough right now is NASA's looking at, depending on who you believe, a many percent cut. And at the same time, they're trying to keep all of their missions that they can going. They're trying to keep all their facilities going. And all of those things have flat costs. So at the end of the day, right now, we're looking at 30 to 50 percent cuts in the money allocated for research grants and for salary. So this means that the people who aren't civil servants are in jeopardy. This means that the projects that aren't absolutely required to keep a mission going are in jeopardy. And this means that last week when I was at the American Astronomical Society meeting, everyone I talked to, the conversation was basically along the lines of, so what's the expiration date on your ability to do science? What's the expiration date on your ability to help communicate what NASA is doing to the world? We're looking at massive cuts, particularly to young people, in who can get a job and who gets to keep a job. Right. Now, you had mentioned earlier on sort of what the process is in the normal time and then the process is in this, in this special time. So this is what you're kind of going on about is... Right. Yeah. So, so right now, what they're doing at NASA headquarters is in different divisions, in, at different layers, depending on what they're looking at, they're convening committees to go through and review what's allowed to live and what's forced to die. Uh, speaking um, about the education, public, and public outreach and communications funding. That's the stuff that pays for citizen science, it pays for K-12 through educators uh, to get materials, that pays for things like NASA TV. They've put together a 12-person panel drawn from NASA headquarters and that panel is going to be reviewing what's going on, not necessarily with any community consultation and deciding how we're going to restructure everything we do. So we've spent the past, I think it's eight years, working to put in proposals to redesign and build a long-lasting foundation on which to disseminate NASA science to the public and to train teachers in what new results are coming out that aren't going to be reflected in their textbooks. And we're looking at losing all of that right now. And that really hurts. Well, I think it's really tough. I mean, especially when you're dealing with the with the aerospace engineers that you know that there're not a lot of jobs if you're an say a uh, planetary geologist working no. on a spacecraft, right? There's literally one provider. And so the problem is that if you if for some reason your budget gets cut and you have to go find another job, you're going to get a job as a computer scientist or making apps for Apple or or working for data analysis for a financial institution. Like you're going, there's a million high-paying jobs that are out there if you're good at technical skills. You know these people. I, I can't doing... tell you how many are going on to project management because yeah. project management pays really good money, and the amount of project management we do just trying to work with NASA is is outstanding. Yeah, no, and I mean we, you know, we in the software world use a lot of NASA's documents as the gold standard for how to run a software project. So, you know, they've defined how to how to do a proper software project. And so anyone who's been training these methodologies can then go anywhere they want and get a fantastic job for lots of money. So, um, so these people are working on spacecraft not because they have to, because that's the, it's because they love to and they want to. And so it's really difficult that if you go and have to lay off your whole 
robotics team, you know, they're going to go and work they're at Tesla. They're not getting them they're, back. They're not coming back. They're going to work at. They're going to work at Tesla. They're going to go work in some manufacturing center. They're they're not going to come back to because there's no other place. You can't just switch from the from the from the this company's rover to the that company's lander. It's just a different. You know, the, these jobs just don't exist. So it's so it's really really dicey to do this kind of budgetary back and forth. It's it's really too bad that this this happens. And and I'm not exaggerating when I say that I'm deeply worried that we're going to lose an entire generation of planetary scientists and uh, public outreach specialists because the money's just going away and we can't recover from that um, and and this this is where all I can say is we have to find an entirely new paradigm and I've, I've been sitting down and talking with a lot of people about how to get commercial funding, but it's very difficult because it's you and I've had this discussion. It's not like we have a business model. We're trying to explore the universe and explain to other people what it is we've found, and that doesn't provide a lot of benefit to stockholders other than teaching them and providing inspiration. And yeah, and yeah. so trying to come up with this new paradigm that allows us to keep keep exploring. Even um, the most financially commercially viable ideas like mining asteroids and stuff are still considered incredibly wild long shots. You know? Right. And that doesn't like like what is the business model of figuring out how old the universe is? You know? And and we're we're moving back to, to the days of well, Herschel, uh, he was the astronomer Royale. You had Kepler, who was funded by the Prussian royalty. You had Galileo, who was funded by uh, all sorts of different people throughout his life, including at various times by the aristocracy and the religious leadership. We're moving back to that time of having to find what today I think would be called angel investors instead of benefactors, but it's really the same thing. And and this is where you hear me begging for money, go to cosmoquest.org slash donate, please give, because I know we're trying to do everything we can to maintain what we can. Yes. All right. Uh, well, I don't know if this was the episode you were planning, Pamela, but this is the episode that we got. So thanks a lot for uh, giving us the the insight into the way uh, the way NASA functions and uh, the challenges that are about to about to happen. So, yeah. Um, someday you'll give us good news. I I can only hope. I just think we need a new Congress first. Right. Well, I I. I maintain, as always, Canada is ready and willing. I speak for all Canada when I say we'll pick up and continue on any of those missions that you guys just can't afford anymore. We're yeah, on. I just don't see you guys budgeting that, but okay, it's good for you to say that. I, I said it. I speak for all Canada. <laughs> our offer, okay. our gracious offer is there. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Saving depressing. Sorry, that got really... Somber yeah, really boy, that went that got dark. There, there was a meeting last week that I was at where I tweeted during the meeting. Sometimes the best you can say is no one is openly weeping because people were trying really hard not to openly weep. But like we have Casey Dreyer show up on the Weekly Space Hangout, and three weeks ago, four weeks ago, he said the news sounded not completely horrible. That that there was, you know some good budgeting set aside for some planetary stuff, so I don't know if that all got thrown out the... So, so it, it's still being argued between the House and the Senate. Um, I think the House is 30 million above, and it's thought that um, the Senate will be a little bit more above what the President's budget was, but we're still looking at cuts. And there's really there there is really nowhere left to cut other than to start canceling missions and firing people. Right. That's all that's left. All right. So I'm just just uploading and then let's. Uh, where's my Dropbox? Mm. <laughs> okay.
I will upload as we as we go as you answer. I will upload. Um, okay. There was there was nothing from Twitter that entire time. No. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So here you go. Here's an easy one. Um, Carl Morris wants to know. Hi, Fraser and Pam. Just want to know: Are black holes made of anything? I don't know. Aren't they just made of the stuff that got sucked into them? But but the the problem is that energy and matter are two sides of the same coin, and we don't know once you get inside of a black hole if it exists as pure energy, if it exists as a quark soup, if there's some sort of strange matter. We don't know. Okay. Fine. <laughs> um. Okay. Uh, Guido Bieber wants to know, so are there any non-bureaucrats working at NASA headquarters? Do astronauts have offices there? Um, there are former astronauts. Charlie Bolden and John Grunsfeld are both former astronauts, but the problem is once you get to NASA headquarters, your job is to move paper that represents projects around in ways that facilitate folks at other locations actually getting the work done. So if you want to talk to astronauts being astronauts, you go to the Johnson Space Flight Center. If you want to talk to astronauts making sure those astronauts get paid, the people taking care of making sure that there's funding for food, funding for launches, fund all of those people, sometimes former astronauts, are NASA headquarters. NASA headquarters is where all the facilitation right. happens, and the people who facilitate are called bureaucrats, and the people who don't facilitate are called politicians. But astronauts tend it's to live in Texas. Black him. Acting astronauts train in Houston. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Nancy Graziano says, I think we need to launch all of Congress into space to study black holes up closely and personally. <gasps> uh, Nancy also wants to know... I, any, I'm taking the fifth. <laughs> any plans for another astronomy cast cruise? So the, the two of us that were working on planning it are both currently dealing with people close to us who are terminally ill, and that had to take priority. And um, so there are loose plans to perhaps do something kind of low-key next winter. I need to look into that. Um, there, there is a castle in Texas that it might be fun to go do a seminar weekend at. Um, but in terms of doing a full-fledged trip, there will be something in Hawaii once we get to the other side of our personal difficulties. Right. So it's that's just the that idea. kind of a black day. Yeah. Yeah. Really. The, so I think we decided that the cruise was super fun, but it wasn't a great platform for astronomy. And I mean yeah. that both literally, and uh, you know, and also sort of you know metaphorically, in that it you know it goes like this, and so we couldn't really look around. And also, so we want a place that is, and that's Hawaii. That's you know. Um, Places in the in the U.S. So there's some places that would also be, I think, a little cheaper, and, but would yeah. also give us nice access to the night sky and telescopes and roads and and WalMarts and things like that. So I think that's what one of the things that we're looking at is is Hawaii is one and and maybe some place in the U.S. So stay tuned, um, but nothing confirmed right now. Because uh, that cruise, we were just like sort of part of a larger cruise, so it wasn't our, we didn't do all the planning. Yeah, so so the, the fundamental problem right now is the two of us that were looking to do the organization just had to put our time and energy elsewhere. If anyone wants to step forward and help us with organization, because their business, their company is focused on doing stuff like this, we are always open to talking. Uh, Michael Jobin wants to know, I wonder if Fraser can speak French or just Canadian. Um, can, well, Canadian isn't a language. It's English. Uh, barely. So all Canadians learn French as a second language through all of our elementary school and high school, and then depending on how much you want to do. Both of my children are completely fluent in French. We've, we've actually put them in a French immersion high school. Uh, it's right in school, elementary school. So my daughter has had eight years of full immersion in French and is completely fluent. My son is now at six years. So uh, they speak. In fact, we went to Paris and they were able to translate and just interact with everyone. It was perfect. It was amazing. So no, my French is terrible. Um, 
How's your French, Pamela? I know your Russian is what you speak. I, I unfortunately only know the French that I learned from Sesame Street and from Miss Piggy, which means that when I try and use my French, one of three things happened. I get this like sideways, curious dog, but with disgust look. The person just bursts out laughing, or they just go this head shake yeah. of solemn no. Yeah. Um, so, so my one and only experience in France consisted of food poison, food poisoning, and being laughed at a lot. But um, my German's a bit better, and my Russian is out of practice, but can be a bit fluent. Yeah, and my Spanish is pretty rusty too. Um, Eric Charlin says, "What do you think of the SpaceX Dragon V2?" The new capsule that was unveiled, SpaceX. Oh, the new capsule. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think that it looks like it was designed by a Star Trek set designer. Totally. And, and <laughs> it's good to see a spacecraft with more computing power than I have sitting on my desk. And I can't wait for them to start launching humans. I mean, the, the brave choice is to just compress all of those... Dash, dashes and dials and knobs and switches and keyboards and all of that into like what looks like just three touch screens. Touch screens. Yeah, and then that's it. There's your there's your interface to the entire spacecraft. Can you imagine how much weight they could throw out not having to have mechanical functionality for, for well, all of that? Not only that, but the seats that they're using, because they're they're made out of modern materials, they no longer have to have inches and inches of foam supported in all sorts of metal frames and everything else. They're just, they look like they're either carbon fiber yeah, or plastic. carbon fiber with probably some kind of Kevlar mesh. They look super lightweight. They're, it's amazing. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite pleased and um, I, I'm waiting for someone to do the uh, crazy, ex where there, there's various things that Google has done in Google Maps where you can zoom in, zoom out, pan all directions, and I'm waiting for one of those to appear. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I just think it's great, right? Like, this is this is the way Elon Musk's brain works, is I'm sure someone was like, we need to figure out what the cockpit's going to look like. And he said, yeah, just make a touch screen. But that's crazy. We can't do a touch screen. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, we totally can. Just do it. So what if it isn't the way we've always done it? It's better. Um, so I think that's I think it's going to be great. I mean, obviously, you know, what do you do if the touch screen goes down? There's going to need to be some kind of manual backup, or maybe not. I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a weird thing. So I think it's great, absolutely fantastic. And I mean, what a way to shave off all the weight, get humans up into space. Go yes. Again, yeah. man, we are such SpaceX fans. They do not pay us money. That's just just so we're clear. We just love them. I yeah, I, I wish they put more money into education and public outreach, but that's just the day I'm having. Um, Hugo Burnham asks, is there any chance of returning deeper regular samples from the moon without sending humans there to find bits of Thea, deeper than the Apollo samples, I mean? So he's talking about Thea. This is the, uh, uh, the I, Mars-sized I object. Learned, yeah, I only learned earlier today that it had been named. You didn't um, know that the predecessor had been named Thea? Yeah. No, I, I somehow totally missed that it had been named. Um, so so the, the issue is you'd have to take so many samples before you started to be able to decouple what is the normal mix of materials, the great crustal splash that is the moon from pockets of non-mixed materials. And while there is the robotic ability to do that, it's not going to happen. Not for a long time. It's just too many funding issues. You basically have to, to shoot an oil rig into space if you think about the drilling apparatus that's used. Right, so you would need some way to take tons and tons of samples and start to try and tease out the, you know, with, I guess, with spectroscopy, try to figure out which parts of the moon are, um, are one kind of chemical composition, which are another kind of chemical composition, and yeah, it would be... Complicated, but I mean they're they're getting a sense. They're starting to tease it out now, which is pretty neat. And there's like some research that happened that was announced this week. The deep ocean stuff, right? But but if you think about it, we we have a very good understanding of the planet Earth, thanks in part to the oil industry 
and also in part due to people just do core samples of stuff. So we have core samples of this, core samples of that, core samples over here. And so we've been able to, between mining, oil wells, and flat out science to get a very good understanding of the distribution of materials on the planet Earth. And so we're able to say, huh, this, this is extremely weird. This has strange isotope ratios. This appears to be material that formed at a different distance from the sun. With the moon, we, we have picked up a whole bunch of rocks that were scattered all over the surface. But we don't have core samples. So it, it would be starting from ground zero. And we'd have to build all of the apparatus to take samples kilometers in length. And we're not there yet. But could it be done without humans? Yes. Totally. Yes, and totally. Now, yeah. Um, you know, I still say that the only, the only use for a human in space is to demonstrate how to not die in space. I shouldn't have been drinking. I should have waited. So, right? So, so that's what a human is for. A human is to demonstrate how to let humans survive in space. That's it. Like, how can we walk, you know, how long can we survive walking around on the surface of the moon? How long can we survive on the microgravity of an asteroid? Can we create a, a spacecraft that can generate artificial gravity? And how long can we survive in that environment? So, and what's the human least beings, amount of gravity? Human beings still think faster. So when it comes to problem solving, selecting sites, we could do science so much faster if we had a human colony on Mars that was in constant contact and able to do fly-by wire with the robots instead of having to try to write AIs to take care of everything. Um, it's that ability, we still have the faster processors. But um, it's it's changing. There was an yeah, AI that long. beat the Turing test earlier today. I. I say it absolutely did not. It beat a terrible Turing test, and people who've actually tried talking to this chatbot have said it's ridiculous. Okay. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that, cry foul and say that it did not. But the fact that a chatbot was able to fool a bunch of you know, people by, by essentially gaming the system, that we're, we're on the road now to having a chatbot actually be able to beat the Turing test, but I, I don't and, think... And what's amusing is that it, the, the ability for a lot of these chatbots to do so well is, like so many technologies, um, being sped by the pornography industry because there are so many chatbots on Skype and other communications platforms trying to entice people to pay money for canned yeah. photography and imagery of naughty things. Um, okay, let's move on. So does Pamela have a favorite observatory? Wants to know Adam Synergy. Do you have a favorite observatory? Um, so my home observatory in terms of like the place that you go to and you can find your way around in the dark without thinking um, is McDonald Observatory. It's where I did all of my uh, master's thesis and dissertation research. Um, beyond that, um, I have to admit, an observatory that's above the clouds is, is going to always be my favorite because clouds really like me. So do tornadoes. And, and so I'm, I'm a huge fan of NASA's Great Observatory Program and all the survey data that is stored in all of the different online repositories that means I can get data without worrying about clouds. So the, ironically, my favorite is Spitzer, I think. Because what? you know, uh, the canceled one. Yeah, yeah, the one that's been canceled. But you know, when it started to do its work and was able to peer through the obscuring dust and start to reveal stuff that had previously been completely unknown to us, like Hubble's great. You know, it can see stuff that we could already see, but with really high resolution. But Spitzer could see stuff in the infrared for the first time. And so, I would say, of all of the missions that I was most excited about, it was. Uh, it's got to be. Spitzer. So um, that's sad that we're going to lose it. Um, all right. I got, uh, I got one more minute and then I got to run. So let's see. Let's okay. see. Um, any more questions? Any more questions over on Google Plus? Now's your chance, people. Come on. All right. Um, <laughs> apparently, there's a big storm in Europe. Really? Yeah. That's not good. Yeah. In people in are mentioning it in in Germany anyway. 
Dang. Guido's experiencing it. Um, okay, here we go. Rich Higgins wants to know, are we headed to a future where our kids are no longer learning science in K-12? <laughs> no, no, we're not heading to that future. We are heading towards a future where the amount of science being taught is being steadily decreased. It, it's, a, it's a funny thing, um, and I, this is going to begin a rant, but I'll try and hold off on it, which is that you talk to people who say, like, kids these days, and there's these, you know, these new electronic gadgets and gizmos, you know, phones and whatever, and you say, oh, kids are so much more experienced with these new gadgets, they're so much better with technology, but they're totally not... That, that they have been detached from the underlying reality of what's going on. They know how to use an app just great. They can use Instagram really quickly and Snapchat with their buddies, but they don't actually know how this stuff works. They can't tinker with it. They can't upgrade it. They can't stand You it. and I built our own computers, mm -hmm. and it's not like I can build my own iMac or iPad, and while you can still build PCs, it's no longer cost-effective. Going to Egghead isn't a way of saving money and spending time. It's a way of spending money. Yeah, yeah, and so I think that same concept is is strange. Like, like we're getting to this point where, where we're all so comfortable with these wondrous things that happen in our modern economy, all, you know, these all these gadgets and gizmos and all these technologies that we just get really comfortable with it, and then people don't see it as a scientific endeavor, that these are the things that we're looking to expand our, our understanding. And then when you look at the various and levels of, of, you know, what percentage of people believe in evolution and, you know, you can see all that starting to, to degrade there, and go backwards. There's so many old Star Trek episodes that, that have the parable of the amazing egalitarian planet where all the needs are met by the computer that is decaying and destroying the society. And I really worry about how much of what we do is becoming black boxes and the need to actually understand science, to understand chemistry is going away as we go to instant food, instant technology, instant everything without having to turn on a Dremel or use a drill or find a saw or use a screwdriver or wiggle a cable, all of these things. Um, yeah. I used to have to pull the cards out of my Apple IIe, blow the dog hair off of them, and put them back in just to get things working again. And We're going to try and uh, replace the front screen on a kid's broken phone. I've got the replacement front digitizer, and we're going to try and take the whole thing apart and put a new one in. It's, it's not designed to be easy. Yeah, it's, it's a different day. Even cars are harder, but me and my 1988... 1998 Jeep Wrangler, I can still replace things as needed. Right. Okay, well, I got to run. Uh, I know you got to run. So, well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, Pamela, as always, for bringing your brain and answering everyone's questions. Um, next up, what, Wednesday? Learning Space? X Prize? Yeah. What's going on? Uh, next up is Wednesday with Learning Space. Friday, we have the weekly space hangout. Sunday, weather permitting, virtual star parties. And life goes on. All right, cool. Well, we actually, I think we we have a new plan for the virtual star party, so we're uh, we're gonna we're gonna push them to a longer time frame. So we're probably gonna be doing one okay. in three weeks from now. But okay. you know, I'll bring you up to speed. <laughs> um, cool. Good. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching, and we will see you all next week. Sounds good, Fraser. <laughs>